Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to um, thank you all for being here. I'm Patrick Carter. I'm the co-director of the University of Michigan Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention, along with my co-director, Mark Zimmerman, back there. Um, we'd like to welcome you all to the event today. The University of Michigan Institute for uh, Firearm Injury Prevention was launched as a presidential uh, initiative in 2019 and then as an institute in 2021 and really focuses on uh, multidisciplinary collaboration across the entire uh, breadth of the university campus, focusing on how we engage everything from social sciences to public policy to public health to medicine to engineering in helping to solve the problem of firearm injuries in the United States. And the Institute explores firearm injuries across the lifespan. So everything from suicide and community violence, unintentional injuries, intimate partner violence, school and mass shootings and police violence with a particular interest in understanding and identifying and addressing the disparities that underlie all of these types of firearm injury by race, gender, geographic distribution, and socioeconomic status. Today, we are uh, incredibly delighted to have Dr. Daniel Webster uh, serve as our first distinguished faculty uh, seminar lecturer. Dr. Webster is the Bloomberg Professor of American Health and Violence Prevention and the co-director of the Center for Gun Violence Solutions at Johns Hopkins University. He studies and is, uh, I would say, the foremost uh, policy expert in the country on understanding uh, what policies and programs uh, can help reduce uh, firearm violence, and he teaches in the School of Public Health there approaches to violence prevention. He also serves as the co-editor and contributor to the book Reducing Gun Violence in America, Informing Policy with Evidence and Analysis, as in studied the effects of a variety of violence prevention initiatives, including firearm and alcohol policies, policing strategies, street out for outreach and conflict mediation, and school-based curricula. Uh, just to kind of give you a little overview of the lecture here today, uh, Dr. Webster will come up and give his lecture. Uh, we will have hopefully some time for questions at the end, and we would ask you to text your questions to this number here on the left so that our, um, our staff from the Institute can collect them and uh, we, can, we can ask them at the end. So uh, I thank you all for being here today and please give Dr. Daniel Webster a warm welcome. Uh, turn my mic on. Here we go. Hi, good afternoon. It's really great to be with you back at University of Michigan. Um, I got my MPH here back in the mid 80s. And um, this, is, this is just really a delight to be here. And also to just to connect more directly with the new institute that Pat and Mark are, are leading with, uh, with a lot of great scholars and postdoctoral fellows. Um, what I'm going to do in, gosh, really fast way is kind of run through what we're facing now in gun violence in America. I'm going to highlight some research findings that I think are relevant, uh, but sort of a theme, perhaps, uh, to what I hope to convey anyway, is that when we address a problem like gun violence, it has been my experience and what I have learned over the 30 years that I've been working in this space, is that we consistently aim low. We, we, we put forward uh, policy or programmatic interventions that usually are not fully up to the task. We make ourselves really comfortable that we have solutions when we should feel a little less comfortable and more driven to innovate. That's sort of the theme I wanna, you know, for us to come to but also have this hope, I truly have this hope that um, science research and other ways that we are going to move the dial uh, to address gun violence effectively. Go out to the trusty keyboard maybe. Neither of them are working. <laughs> Can I hit that? It's not doing anything either. Yeah. I, I click this thing. I'm going to keep clicking mouses. And, okay, cool. There we go. All right. Um, 
noteworthy trends. Uh, so we're looking at fire mortality, the uh, two key uh, forms of gun violence that uh, uh, make up the overwhelming majority of deaths in, in the United States. The blue line is firearm suicide, the red is firearm homicides. What I wanna underscore here is this dramatic change that we had from 2019 to 2018 this is literally the largest one year increase in percentage terms uh, since we've been tracking it. What's even more remarkable is that this big, huge surge only began around in May and June. So it was an enormous change very, very rapidly. Oops. Um, and the at least racial group that is most impacted are people who are black uh, has always had a higher rate of uh, firearm homicides, but their increase was even more dramatic during this. Um, some people use the term uptick. To me, that sounds like eh, it kind of went up a little bit. I think surge. We had a surge in gun violence. Um, this simply is the month of the year and uh, the percent change in 2020 and 2021 relative to uh, 2019 for people who are black. And you see again that um, beginning in the, in the, in the uh, June-ish, uh, we got to a place of about 50 to 60% higher rates of firearm homicide for people who are black. A lot was going on in 2020. We kind of, in public health, in, in other spaces, we kind of reflectively just say the pandemic. It's more than the pandemic. The pandemic, of course, was a huge social upheaval in so many of her ways and so many of our social institutions. But it was also a time of uh, very um, high profile um, acts of police violence followed by protests, followed by violent response to police to those protests. Um, so it was a time of really big, big upheaval. And um, being someone who's worked in Baltimore and we had our own uprising in 2015 after an in custody death of um, Freddie Gray, that was remarkably similar in how abrupt and concentrated this change was. So I think in public health, we have not fully understood this sort of connection to faith in and trust in policing as one important thing that is contributing to gun violence. Here's just a couple of other images for that. And of course, uh, we were also perhaps in the most hostile, divisive presidential election during this same time frame that I think is relevant. This is a, a line out the door of a gun store. Um, it has lo been long known, well before this recent upheaval, that gun acquisition is very closely tied to trust in police, trust in, in, in government generally. During the pandemic and protest era, guess what? Our, our faith in those institutions uh, went down quite dramatically and people um, armed up. This is simply a graph. The red bar is relative to the 2019 numbers for um, background checks for firearm acquisitions, um, comes from the Brady Center. But these are really historic and a very abrupt uh, increases in background checks as an indicator for um, gun purchases. We've had ups, upticks, so to speak, uh, or increases in gun homicide, or excuse me, in gun acquisition in, in other years. But more commonly, it is people who are already gun owners arming up even more. This was a little bit different. A uh, survey led by Matthew Miller. Uh, done in April of 2021, looked at recent gun acquisition, they ascertained that 2% of the adult population uh, during this pandemic era, if you will, uh, became a, uh, brought a gun into a home that previously did not have a gun. 
and that this actually affected uh, 11 million additional people who had exposure within their own homes to guns. Now, half of these new acquisitions for, were uh, for women, which quite bluntly uh, makes me feel a lot better. Firearm violence is overwhelmingly a male phenomenon. I'm not super duper as worried or concerned about more women arming up. I'm not saying there's nothing to be concerned about, but I'm, I'm noting this is a very gendered phenomenon that we're looking at here. 20% um, of the new gun owners were black and 20% were Hispanic. Interestingly, that was exactly what they found in 2019, even before these changes. Also important is the policy environment uh, of what's going on. There has been substantial deregulation of state concealed carry laws. Um, within, uh, since 2016, you have 16 states that completely did away with any licensing requirement whatsoever to carry a loaded concealed firearm in public places. Um, now, half of our states have permitless carry. And uh, if I, I suspect most people noticed, we had a recent Supreme Court case that um, struck down a, a law in New York that is a discretionary type of law where they were only issuing licenses to people who had a, uh, a special need or, or justifiable cause. That's no longer you can do that. So we're going to have more deregulation. Um, and my, my feeling about this and sort of trying to understand these, these trends is that really the big thing is not just more gun ownership or acquisition, it's really more gun carrying that is, is the driver here and we need to be thoughtful about. Um, and again, most gun acquisition is going to be safe. We know that statistically. Gun ownership is a really common phenomenon. Most people who have guns, are, nothing bad is gonna happen, okay? But there are other channels in essence for um, legal to illegal or risky, uh, less risky to more risky. We know that when, uh, with new research by John Donahue, that when you deregulate concealed carry laws, a lot of people leave their guns in their motor vehicles and a lot of them, those guns get stolen. It's estimated at a 35% increase in gun thefts associated with concealed carry laws. Simultaneously, we're also seeing a surge in what some refer to as ghost guns or privately made firearms, going from about 2,500 in 2017 to nearly 2,000 uh, recorded by the ATF. That is a huge underestimate, by the way. We really don't have a particularly good way to track this. Uh, one city that is tracking this very carefully is Oakland, California. There's others as well. But in a study that's published, I think, just about a week ago, Anthony Braga and co colleagues looked at guns recovered in crime in the city of Oakland. And the, the solid line are what we call fast guns, guns that move very quickly from a retail sale to involvement in a crime. And you see this abrupt change, of course, in 2020 into 2021, but even the more dramatic thing is the dotted line, which represents privately made firearms or ghost guns, going from 1.4% to 24%. This is incredibly alarming. One other sort of indicator, again, coming from the gun trace data, uh, these fast guns uh, are going up and they're going up quite rapidly. Percentage of guns that are these fast guns going up again quite abruptly. So, and, and then um, generally speaking, weapon related arrests, these are illegal gun possession cases. Even while we are deregulating um, and, and having no permit requirement, we are still seeing more arrests for illegal gun possession. It's another indicator like all these flows of guns into the underground market into risky context. Sorry, that's a bleak picture. Now I'm gonna say public health, this is what we can do, okay? Um, I, I published an article earlier this year <clears throat> um, talking about at least my vision for what a public health approach is. 
I hope it will sound familiar to you, but it starts with being data-driven and pragmatic. That is what public health is. Um, we're focused not only on risky behaviors, but at least from my vantage point, unsafe communities or environments and the policies that create those unsafe conditions. Our orientation for population health is we need to reform the systems are creating lack of safety or, or, or lack of health. And, and this is maybe the most perhaps debatable or contentious dimension to this. In the, in the popular conversation, public health is always offered as an alternative to using laws, law enforcement, or anything in a criminal justice system to address a problem like gun violence. That is not my own view. We have used laws in public health since public health has been around. Um, not always right or the best way, but we have saved a lot of lives. So it is my feeling when you're talking about a country with so many guns and such lax gun laws, policing and criminal justice is gonna be part of what we do to minimize the harms. And as public health people, our commitment should be to reform of those systems so that they are equitable and effective. Um, and then finally, the most effective uh, approaches are highly targeted to the individuals and situations that are creating the greatest risk. And even though uh, gun violence is way too common in our country, it really affects a very small population with great needs and risks. So we have to be hyper-focused to be effective. I mentioned starting with data. I'm just very briefly uh, a, a approach that I'm very um, taken with and, and actually recruited the woman who created the Milwaukee Homicide Review Commission, Mallory O'Brien, to Johns Hopkins to join our faculty because we feel like this is a sort of a foundational public health approach. You're looking at data in real time with a variety of vantage points, uh, service providers, community members, law enforcement, to understand the problem as it is right now and have data informed solutions. And there's actually an accountability process in this as well. In 2020, in the fall, I was uh, very pleased to be part of a group of scholars who um, banded together to uh, write a report that um, I'm very proud of, but I don't really love the name. The name is Reducing Violence Without Police, a Review of Research Evidence. The point of this endeavor was to say, while there's a lot of things we can do to reduce violence, aside from locking people up. But of course, none of these happened with police vacant, <laughs> okay? So police were there, it's just like, what can we do other than policing? And many are familiar, and there's been foundational research led here at University of Michigan about creating safe environments in neighborhoods. Uh, and so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, one study I just love because of the uh, great uh, return on investment, um, rehabbing um, vacant homes to make them look occupied in Philadelphia. One study showed a 39% reduction. So that was one example under that set of recommendations. We also ex examined um, timely and targeted financial assistance to those in greatest needs. Uh, we looked at, again, a number of policies and evidence about that but again, I'm gonna highlight the housing component to this because I think it's particularly relevant right now in our crisis of affordable housing. Based in, in part on this research showing that uh, when a, a home becomes foreclosed and, and, and vacant, um, immediately 19% uh, increase in violent crime around those areas. Philadelphia has something uh, called a basic systems repair program to give grants uh, to help low-income homeowners maintain their homes so they don't decline in value, they don't become foreclosed, and found remarkable uh, beneficial effects in reducing violence. Uh, we covered alcohol uh, and drug issues. Um, that's another talk that is important, but I'm gonna skip over that for now. And I'm gonna focus on the last two areas, which is using credible messengers to mediate conflicts, increase pro-social bonds, and promote antisocial norms, as well as policies to keep firearms from people who might be inclined for violence. 
those are two areas that I've spent a decent amount of time studying. And I'll start with, again, sort of this general way I'm, I'm thinking right now about successful gun violence prevention is obviously we always are learning from the past. We're doing our evaluation studies. We're learning what works, what doesn't work and why. Um, but we really have to have our eyes on the future and be very cognizant of what changes are occurring that may require us to uh, really think is our evidence still adequate for today and to blend quantitative science, rigorous quantitative science with qualitative evidence from those who are closest to the problem. And again, our focus should be on, of course, we wanna help the individuals most impacted, but we're gonna do that best on a population scale by transforming systems. So one type of intervention I've looked at is um, community violence intervention. A common brand name that people in public health are familiar with is Cure Violence uh, for this approach. The simplified uh, explanation is that it involves outreach to the highest risk individuals within a community with credible messengers. These are generally people who live in those neighborhoods, actually often have relationships with the individuals at highest risk. They typically had some prior life experience where they were doing bad things, okay? Uh, but they've turned their uh, lives around. And these individuals are um, charged with uh, mediating conflicts, promoting different norms to respond to conflicts and provocations, and to generally rally community support for those sets of norms. Um, been a number of studies. Um, Remarkably few that got into the peer review literature, many of them with uh, limit, you know, notable methodological limitations. I'm not going to go through every one, but I'll just generally say we have some studies from the early days in Chicago with this program that show a lot of success, but not always. Um, these are basic designs in which they're looking at uh, communities or neighborhoods with this program and some selected comparisons and, and exactly how they identify those comparisons isn't always super scientific. Um, we have another uh, slightly more recent um, study from uh, Katerina uh, Roman um, in North Philadelphia, um, one in Trinidad and Tobago, generally showing positive effects. Been a lot of research done in New York City uh, I'm about to launch some additional research of these programs in New York, um, but uh, you'll see over a span of time uh, some promising findings with these um, relatively simple comparisons of, of other neighborhoods that didn't get the program. Most recent one uh, by Delgado and um, colleagues, it's interesting, they looked at two different metrics, one with uh, police data, one from hospital data, and they didn't necessarily see consistent findings there. And I honestly still sort of scratching my head why, I don't really know. But there's generally some positive things to take away from, again, some simple comparative um, looks at interrupted time series. Uh, I've alluded to some of the methodological problems already. Uh, there are no randomized trials. This is hard to do. I'm not, I'm not hating on anybody for not doing a randomized trial with community violence intervention, but are just noting that we don't have that. Um, there's likely to be some selection bias issues that we haven't fully accounted for. Um, most of the studies have almost no controls for other things that influence gun violence. Um, and we have very minimal data from the people most directly impacted, the people who the credible messengers are connecting with. We have very little data on them and their actual risk and experiences. Um, we only have one published study, and I'm a uh, senior author on this, that sort of examines uh, a common issue with observation, uh, observational designs, which is uh, parallel trend assumptions and, and trying to address them, in this case, with a synthetic control approach. I'll share um, some, um, a sneak peek at some findings. We have probably another month of data to update with these analysis, but looking um, uh, I'm, I'm continuing to do evaluation work in Baltimore, where I started uh, doing this work in 2007. 
what you're looking at now is estimates of percent change in these uh, different measures of gun violence um, uh, using augmented synthetic control approaches. If anybody wants to have that conversation during q and I'm happy to have it, but it's a, it's a fairly rigorous method that does a pretty good job of, of predicting these trends and the directions they're going and uh, hopefully then uh, uh, getting a, a reasonable um, non-biased counterfactual to estimate program impact. If you look at truncated results, just look at four years out, um, generally some positive findings, particularly on the homicide uh, uh, ledger. Um, interesting, McElroy Park, the first site, had such a disparate uh, um, estimate of effect for fatal versus non-fatals that I find very interesting. Uh, I have some theories, but um, anyway, um, it's, uh, there, there's mostly positive, but some questions basically from these truncated results. If you extend the uh, data out as we have to even further than four years, some of the early estimates of program effect um, disappear. And we've diagnosed this a little more. And basically the first three years of the intervention is where you see these impacts. And then, and then these early sites, they have faded. Um, the, the one that has had the most robust and consistent effect is in Park Heights in Northwest Baltimore. It's a study that actually our uh, Youth Violence Prevention Center uh, helped fund support and, and, and enhance their operations. There are new sites that were uh, six new sites in 2019 and 2020. We have some early estimates uh, of overall gun violence and um, you know, nothing consistent there. And I, um, so I'll say a little bit about sort of the backstory of sort of how I'm un, uh, understanding um, the pattern of data over a long span of time in uh, a lot of different sites. Um, generally, and, and this is sort of holds in our um, difference in difference regression analyses, uh, three of 11 sites tend to look pretty good, having some program effects, at least for some reasonable amount of time. Um, what's not in any of these estimates are the three sites that were shut down. They started the program, things didn't go particularly well. Um, and so you have three out of 14 sites using this program model over a span of years that seem to have some beneficial effects. The, what I consider to be you know, the, the thing to learn from here is a couple of things. One is the funding and management really suffered for this program for a good long period of time. It's a hard program to do and you can't take your eyes off of it. Uh, workers did not get a, a pay raise for like seven, eight years, if you can imagine that. And then the, the site that really tailed off in its effectiveness, um, they had two workers living out of their, their cars and another who had to leave because of mental trauma from the whole job. So we're learning that this, just how hard this enterprise is and what it takes to support people to be effective in it. So I think that there's lots of things to keep learning. But the other thing I wanna mention is community gun violence is changing dramatic in our urban environments over the span of times that all of these studies that I'm talking about. This program model was really oriented towards gang mediations. It's developed in Chicago in the 1990s, uh, and they could be really effective. They could get two heads of gangs to call a truce. That's not what things look like now. It's not driven by big gangs. It's only minimally dri driven by drugs. A lot of different things are very different. So in my mind, we need to look with really fresh eyes towards innovation. Uh, one of my former doctoral students, Jen Whitehill, did her dissertation research with some qualitative research with violence interrupters in Baltimore and Chicago and learned a, a few nuggets I just wanna hold up here. One was that the hardest conflicts for mediate were those retaliating for previous homicide or shooting. Second is that the violence interrupters, when they were trying to talk people out of those retaliatory acts, 
always would focus on the risk of incarceration. During our time of less program effects in Baltimore is when our ability, the police ability to close shootings and homicides completely tanked. So we should not be thinking of violence interruption as an alternative to law enforcement. It is a complement that when they work well together when they are both working. The final thing that I think is really important, and it's something we're going to try to look at more in our upcoming research, is uh, if you have you know, four sites that are completely spread out around the a city, their ability to kind of work together is uh, very minimal, right? It may take a sort of a critical mass and perhaps less rigidity in terms of the space of, in which they work because conflicts run across neighborhood boundaries. You need greater flexibility to respond to what gun violence looks like. And that's why I started with this homicide shooting review model. You need to understand those sort of fundamental things so that you apply an intervention that matches your data. It's very sort of fundamental again to public health. Another common solution discussed is hospital-based violence intervention. I'm gonna cover this really fast because I realize, how much time do I have? Okay, I'll take a breath and I'm okay. Um, so another common strategy is hospital violence intervention programs. This is a, a type of intervention that's really growing in popularity and more funding in this, in this space. The general idea is, uh, and, and Dr. Carter, Carter knows this very well, people coming in with a gunshot or stab wound, really high risk folks, okay? really at risk for repeat injury or, or committing violence themselves. And these programs are based on this idea like, wow, we need, this is a time to intervene. You got a high-risk person. Perhaps this is a moment where uh, things can change. Perhaps they'll be more motivated because they're seriously injured um, and get them a variety of kinds of assistance because what we know is these folks have a range of problems and issues that, they, that bring them to that trauma bay with their uh, gunshot or stab wound. Um, I've just completed a review of uh, published research on these programs with Joseph Richardson, Chris St. Bill, and um, um, Nick Meyerson, Rachel Topazian, uh, two of my doctoral students, um, that I hope will come out later this year. Here's the summary of what we found. The obvious, needs and risk of survivors are really substantial. There are very few randomized trials. Five of them examine repeat injury risk. One of those found significant treatment effects on repeat injuries, at least for those that make their way to a hospital. This is the one that I'll talk about in just a, a minute, uh, led by Carnell Cooper in Baltimore, across town from Hopkins. There were two, uh, there were three uh, randomized trials that uh, where they were able to look at criminal offending records of the individuals and controls involved. And two of those, so some protective effects. I'll note that the second one um, by Tina Chang and colleagues, uh, the reduction was for minor crimes for juveniles over a very short period of time. So that's good, but I don't know how excited to get. There was a bigger difference in the um, intensive in intervention done at shock trauma in Baltimore. Um, very, uh, a great deal of investment in those individuals, a very small number of individuals who they were, who was touched and involved in the study. One reason is that they only examined people who were currently on parole or probation. And it was a partnership between the hospital intervention program and the Department of Correctional Services to lower the risk for this population. It's, that's of note because HVIPs, using shorthand, are often presented as an alternative to criminal justice interventions. And the most effective one that we have is actually a partnership between health, social services, criminal justice, partners. Now, there's a number of non-RCTs. Um, uh, two of the seven showed some lower repeat uh, injury risk. Um, and 
two out of two show protective effects for future offending records. But the main important thing to know is that the, the methyl, there's huge methodological weaknesses in this body of research. The primary one is selection bias. There is not one single study that looks at an intent to treat kind of approach to looking at intervention effects, treatment effects. That is how you estimate treatment effects. You have to look at this because if you only look at the people who really love your program, they are a selected group and you have selection bias to state the obvious. Um, most of these studies report no data on people who dropped out, said no thank you uh, to non-participants. So we're looking at a select group, how they did relative to another group that were, they didn't do the same kind of selection. Makes sense. Very small sample size, short follow-ups. Um, and then like the two interventions that sort of seem most promising and effective, um, big questions about scalability and, and external validity. One, as I mentioned, uh, was a partnership with uh, correctional services. I haven't seen that replicated yet. The study, the data now are 20 years old. Um, so big questions here. Our group had some recommendations for uh, future programming based upon available science and actually direct experience. Joe Richardson, actually, uh, my co-author, actually ran one of these programs himself. One was, and, and I, I, th this is what I personally feel like is the most important thing. Um, there's a huge disconnect between this idea of someone's coming in, into your, your trauma unit or, or emergency department and you're, you're doing some sort of risk assessment. Like, okay, well, they've got substance abuse and they don't have a job or the housing isn't secure and so on. The most critical and immediate issue for them and their risk is someone just shot them. That person's probably still out there. And there is minimal discussion about connecting two violence intervention programs to prevent repeat or retaliatory violence in this whole body of literature. So we're hoping that with more investment in both HVIPs and community violence intervention, we start to get it at the right scale where we can have partnerships and linkages for what I, our group at least thinks is the most critical and immediate need as it relates to their risk for repeat violence. There's also, and this is in a similar vein, limited um, uh, assistance to relocate people if they're in immediate danger. So you're throwing people out into the same environmental context that they just came in with a gunshot wound and hoping that your wraparound social services is gonna protect them. And I don't know if that's a safe assumption. Uh, behavioral change methods are uh, in the body of uh, research right now are quite minimal, not really based upon uh, a, a lot of science, sadly. I'll share an alternative uh, uh, approach that I think is very encouraging. Um, and I'll just sort of turn to that. Um, this is sort of the direction I hope that some of this work will go. So Ready Chicago, in Chicago, uh, is a very intensive program to identify these same group of high-risk folks that everybody's trying to connect with with the right outreach worker. And you know, if you talk to them, they say we do re relentless outreach. Like we don't talk to them once, we talk to them a dozen times before they get, we get them into the program. And then they're sort of assisted into an employment opportunities where they get paid and they get help and support so that they don't get fired their first week of, uh, on, they're on the job because they have a short fuse and they tell their boss to go to hell or whatever. So, uh, so they get support and then there, there's, uh, and this perhaps maybe is the most important thing is they do a range of individual and group uh, cognitive based um, behavior change approaches to try to slow down the thinking so that people aren't impulsively responding to insults or conflicts with violent responses. They also get personal coaches, by the way, so that's nice. Um, in uh, a study released earlier this year uh, by the University of Chicago Crime Lab, 
um, and randomized trial looking at data over the first 20 months of uh, over 2,400 people. 20% 20 lower rate of victimization for shooting and homicide and a 65% lower rate of arrests for shootings and homicides. Now, the significance levels are not what would be ideal, but these are rare but incredibly important and costly outcomes that you're looking at. Because gun violence is so costly, these the cost-benefit ratio estimates range from 3.8 to 1 to 18 to 1 uh, for investment in these types of programs. I think it's very encouraging. They're, they're uh, continuing this research and going to look at it, things in 40 months. Now let's talk about gun policy for a minute. I just want to underscore, um, I think I did said something like this in my TED talk, but basically guns don't fall from the sky or sprout from the ground. They, there, there is a channel, okay? And what we know, and we need to know more, but um, they're coming from a very small percentage of licensed gun dealers. And those guns are moving very quickly from a retail sale to a crime involvement. One estimate, and this is dated data, uh, but 1% of licensed dealers account for 57% of crime guns. We know from trafficking investigations, federal trafficking inve investigations, that because the volume of the guns involved in those investigations that uh, involve licensed dealers, that they actually account for more than half of trafficked guns connected to scoff-off dealers. So, Addressing that problem is, is important. We did our own somewhat small study um, in um, Baltimore, but it's an underground gun market. We found that a little less than a third said that uh, there were certain gun shop employees who would sell guns off the books. 24% said they knew where to go uh, to get make it easier to get guns without a background check. This was not shocking to us. Not go into too much detail on every single study, but we looked at gun trace data when it was more available uh, than it is right now. What we found is that, well, uh, and I said this in my talk last night, is the federal policies for regulating oversight of, of licensed gun sellers are incredibly weak. Some states have tried to fill that gap with their own regulations and oversight practices. And the short story is that we find that that makes a huge difference. The, the rated these fast guns moving from retail to crime involvement are quite substantially lower when the state has its own regulations and oversight practices. We've also found from our studies of undercover stings and legal actions against um, gun dealers who are breaking the law basically, that we see uh, in, in the cases of Chicago and Detroit, quite substantial reductions broadly in guns being diverted uh, for criminal use. Um, we think this has some of a chilling effect when you take those kind of actions. And we look very specifically at data from New York City of gun dealers that they sued and found a whopping 82% who, through a legal agreement, agreed to safer business practices that actually we helped develop for the city of Chicago or New York in their litigation and 82% reduction. So the bottom line here is like, we know generally how these are being diverted. We know you can change them, that practice, and we just need to do it. Oh, and uh, well, mostly the, the, my story on handgun purchaser licensing, some of you have heard, but generally speaking, uh, we have weak gun laws for vetting people who wanna acquire a gun. There's only now eight states in the District of Columbia that have what we call handgun purchaser licensing laws. What these are, you have to apply directly to law enforcement to get these licenses, typically anyway, not always. Um, and usually there's fingerprinting, sometimes there's safety uh, training requirements. Um, and uh, my colleague, Alex McCourt, and I was a senior author on this, uh, published a study in 2020 where we contrasted what happened in Connecticut and Missouri. Connecticut adopted this type of law in 1995. Missouri repealed the law had been in place since the 20s in um, 2007. Um, 
I'll note that it was sort of a comparative case study where the other two states just filled the gap in the private sale loophole for background checks. And we saw no changes in those states, okay? We only saw this change when you had a licensing component that complements the background check. Again, the sort of theme is we're aiming too low with the same background checks. We need to be thinking licensing. Uh, using synthetic control methods, we estimated a 24% lower rate of firearm uh, homicides over 22 years. It's a lot, adds up to a lot of lives saved. Even more lives saved actually is from suicides. We had a 33% estimated reduction in suicide rates over that span of time. Missouri repealed it. We estimate 47%. Now, honest to God, our, our fit in this model was not as great as I would have hoped. Using some other methods though, um, we consistently find at least around 25% increase in firearm homicide rates. So I don't know the exact number, but it's a big number. Oops. And same thing with suicides, 24% increase in firearm suicides. We know the key mechanisms because we studied it. And it's principally this diversion I've been talking about that we looked at um, both, well, longitudinally in Missouri and when uh, Maryland adopted licensing in uh, October of 2013, but we also complemented that trace data with um, the surveys of people in the underground gun market in Baltimore. 40% said it, that law made it harder to get a gun on the underground market. We've also linked this policy to lower rates, significantly lower rates of fatal mass shootings and uh, uh, reductions in shootings involving law enforcement, both as victims and offenders. The uh, basic bar graph here, but we have some more sophisticated analysis showing very dramatically rates at which police shoot civilians fatally when there's handgun purchaser licensing versus not. Police are basically encountering far few people in risky uh, situations that have firearms. I'll end uh, generally discussion. What's my time? Sorry. Okay, I'll do it. Just published a study uh, led by Mitch Doucette. I'm a senior author in American Journal of Epidemiology, looking at the movement of so-called May issue concealed carry to shall issue. Um, May issue is a discretionary. Um, uh, shall issue is not, basically. The important thing, there's been a lot of studies on this question. The best ones and more recent ones are showing higher rates of gun violence. We did too. What's new with this, aside from our methods, augment synthetic control with fixed effects. Um, and if anybody can get through all the graphs in our appendix, I'm just gonna really applaud you. Uh, it's kind of insane. I'm almost a little bit embarrassed. Um, but uh, the important takeaway actually is that when you move to made a shout issue, if you had certain safety provisions in there, you actually mitigated the, the risk quite substantially. So if you prohibited violent misdemeanors was the biggie. We also some, saw some protective effect of, of uh, live fire training. But when you have none of those things, you have increases of um, assaults with guns, 25% uh, or more. So. Pretty substantial. I'll end it on um, recognizing perhaps one of the most challenging things that we face right now, which is we know, I, I started this conversation about that people are carrying more guns in more risky environments. What do we do about it? This is the same time that we're trying to reform policing and criminal justice approaches. We know that they are biased, racially biased, stop and frisk policies that are harmful to individuals and communities. We also know that highly targeted um, proactive gun law enforcement truly does save lives, and there's a disproportional benefit effect for uh, communities most impacted, which are predominantly um, uh, high percentage uh, low income black and brown. So we did a project um, in Baltimore where there was a real crisis in this exact thing. 
Um, and we brought those sort of data nuggets to bear, but more importantly, we went and surveyed and did focus groups in the most impacted communities by gun violence. And we asked them, how do you see this problem? What do you want from police in this? And what they told us was very practical for a policy recommendation that we present that um, actually our new state prosecutor, I think is gonna implement many of our recommendations. And that is, no, they don't really like all this, you know, stop anybody that, you know, looks suspicious or something, but they, they do recognize that there's a small group of individuals that police should be more attentive to, I guess. And, but more, more importantly, is that there really needs to be an accountability and transparency process in how that policing gets done. The people in best position to do that, if you have a, the right one, is actually the prosecutors who are looking at the evidence of these cases, looking at the body worm camera uh, uh, evidence, looking at the pattern of, of stuff. So I'm gonna end that conversation there, uh, recognizing that it's a huge challenge, gets to sort of some of the core issues that we're struggling with now, which is uh, a huge public safety challenge of gun violence. At the same time, we are having a crisis when it comes to uh, policing. Thank you so much, Daniel. And just if the audience would give Daniel a nice round of applause. So just a reminder for the audience members to please text your questions into this number. We have folks monitoring them. Um, we had a couple come in while you were talking. Um, uh, the first one, you know, was around, can you explain why you think, um, you know, non-fatal shootings increased 150% in that one site uh, for safe streets in Baltimore? And then I would pee back on that and ask, um, you know, the role of training and fidelity and implementation of these types of interventions that are being done and, um, and the importance of that. So basically, how do I interpret disparate outcomes for fatal and non-fatal? <clears throat> I don't know for certain, just to be blunt. <clears throat> Here's a couple of different ways to, to think about it. It could be, quite honestly, that um, there was some degree of luck in the fatals. Uh, and so when you put these two together, in, which we did in our last outcome measure, you get no change. So it could be that um, one could argue that let's just increase our sample, look at that, and that's really what's happening in gun violence. The only reason I'm not 100% okay with that is there does seem to be a consistent pattern with more effects for fatal than non-fatal. And I think that's not by accident. I think it's because homicides are more planned activities. And that's precisely what a violence interrupter does. When he hears wind of somebody's planning to go do something to somebody, they're literally going to intervene. More non-fatal shootings are more spontaneous things. Somebody gets pissed off, you take my parking place, or you looked at my girlfriend the wrong way, or you know all these things. So it could be the nature of the intervention itself and how it was carried out in that community that showed you these two patterns. But it's still, I still don't know about this bump in the non-fatals and what to make of that. Only, it, I should, um, I wish, well, there's at least a couple of the, the workers from that earlier day that I could connect on this, but I mean, did they convince somebody not to kill them, but just to shoot them in the leg? I don't know. But certainly, it's, it's possible. I don't know. Uh, a question uh, from one audience member about um, the effectiveness of red flag laws. Red flags are, uh, in, in gun policy world, we often refer to them as extreme risk protection order laws. These are sort of use the civil court process, much like domestic violence restraining order. April Zioli is studying that stuff right now as an expert in it. Um, what do we know about their effectiveness? We don't know a ton yet. There's a few studies out there that, um, showing some favorable uh, results for reducing suicide risk, which is the most common uh, set of circumstances in which ERPO laws are used. Excuse me. Um, 
but I, honestly, I think we need we still need more data on that. There, there's other just sort of case series kind of things that are quite frankly very compelling, just to sort of understand the circumstances in which they were used, and uh, nothing bad happened. Because, you know, after firearms were removed, whether it was because firearms were removed, that's a harder uh, question to answer. Jeff Swanson is trying to answer that. I don't think he's quite got there. Just my own opinion. So there's a question from the audience about, um, you know, you talked about different types of interventions in different settings, community settings, and then hospital settings. And, you know, how do we, what's the barrier to scaling those up and, and implementing those? And I guess I would add to that, you know, is the barrier you talked a lot about the need for higher quality studies, is that one of the barriers um, to that? Well, look, I, I, it's not obvious. Definitely, we need higher quality studies. We need more funding. But honestly, in my view, we also need to think differently. We, for, for, you know, I've been doing this stuff for 30 years, and it hasn't been different throughout that. Well, actually, it's only recently changed, where we always thought about these as programs. Hey, let's get a grant. Do something little neat and see, hey, does this work? But hardly any commitment to like, wow, if we're actually gonna be integrating this into a public safety system so that we have less gun violence, what does that look like? How do you graduate from a program to a system? And that's where I think the exciting work really needs to be done, but it's a big investment. And quite honestly, there's political risk there. Uh, but. I think that they're actually, in many cities, they're ready to stick their neck out and try to do that. They're starting to move in that direction. Um, yeah. Great, and then maybe the last question. Um, you know, there's a lot of exciting work obviously going on here at University of Michigan with the new institute and at your center uh, for gun violence solutions at Johns Hopkins. We have a lot of students in the audience. For students and trainees who are interested in this field and want to get engaged in this field, do you have words of wisdom or advice for them as they move forward in this career path? Um, I'll try a few, and we covered a little bit of this ground with my lunch with the postdoctoral fellows, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, one is recognize that, wow, this is a really important time. There are more resources and more um, momentum for conducting research that will help solve this really pressing problem. So it's really exciting. You can make a successful career in doing this. Um, expect it to be hard though. I mean, this is a tough area in, in any and all ways. It's hard intellectually, it's hard, frankly, emotionally. Um, it could seem at times to feel quite daunting and hopeless, of, you know, studying this problem. So um, you have to sort of say, are you up for that? And you know, how do you take care of yourself if you're gonna do this work? And I think you do. Um, so, um, and, and the, I guess the last message is sort of, again, sort of coming back to the theme of my talk, which is don't, don't be comfortable with the research that's been done before. We're in a new place right now. We need a new set of eyes, new set of data, new thinking, and you're in a position to lead that work. I hope that inspires you uh, because frankly, we really need you. Good note to close on. So thank you so much again, Dr. Webster. <laughs>